Welcome. I hope you all can hear me nice and clear. Is it good? Do I get the thumbs up? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today for Poets and Writers virtual check-in for Southern California Literary Presenters. My name is Jamie Asai Fitzgerald and I am the Director of Poets and Writers California Office and our Readings and Workshops West Mini Grants Program. I'm here with Ricardo Hernandez, our Program Coordinator, who will be helping to facilitate today's check-in. Poets and Writers has been holding community building events like this one for many years throughout California. And for the past few years with the support of the California Arts Council for which we're very grateful. These convenings align with our mission to promote communication throughout the literary community. Where we are now is the theme for today's check-in. And I thought it would be an appropriate time now that we're a year and a half into the COVID-19 pandemic um, and hopefully seeing light at the end of the tunnel, things are starting to open up a little bit more. I'm starting to see grant applications for our in-person events again, um, which we are now accepting uh, and we're still funding virtual events too. Um, so I just feel like, you know, it's hopeful um, that things can start to equalize or re-equalize. And it's a good time to hear from you as presenters of literary events um, about what you've been through during this time, what you're taking away, what you've learned, um, and what you're looking forward to and how you see things taking shape. Um, as you move forward through this transitional period. So during your check-in, please also feel free to share any resources that you've found valuable during this period uh, or resources that you need or have to offer. And if you need a review of the check-in questions, Ricardo is going to put them into the chat. Uh, so you can look there if you can't remember exactly the millions of questions that I asked. <laughs> um, so the way it'll work is I'll call your name. And uh, if you're here just to listen, it's okay to pass. And then I'll just move on to the next person. Um, and then everyone has two minutes. Uh, and Ricardo will try to keep time and he has a little timer and you might hear a little beep, beep, beep. And that'll let you know that you've reached your two minutes. And I just wanna say, don't panic, it's okay. Uh, just, you know, that will be your cue to kind of begin to wrap up your comments. Um, but, you know, no, no huge pressure or anything. We just want to try to get in as many people as we can in our hour and a half together. So um, my hope is that after our special guests, we can hear from at least up to 25. And I see we have 21 participants. So, you know, I think we're gonna do fine. Um, and then uh, let's see what else. Just uh, keep muted while others are speaking. And after you've done your check-in, just be sure to re-mute yourself so we don't get any weird echoes or or interference. So with that, I don't wanna take up too much time of our precious time. I am going to call on our first special guest, uh, Quentin Ring of Beyond Baroque to offer your check-in. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, thanks for organizing this and, and thanks also to Ricardo for um, all your support of it as well. Um, really nice to see everyone here. Um, I know many of you, um, you know, uh, nice to see some new faces I don't know as well. Um, so yes, my name is Quentin Ring. I am the executive director of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. Uh, we're located in Venice uh, here in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, in a normal, normal years before the pandemic, we, uh, you know, we hold roughly 150 to 200 events a year in our theater, um, as well as numerous free weekly workshops, as well as paid workshops. 
Um, we certainly were able to hold events during the pandemic. Um, that being said, we did have to scale way back. Um, there is no way for us to sort of totally translate all the events we do in person um, online. And so, um, you know, the first, the first thing we decided to work on was our workshops. We have our, our, our free um, Wednesday night poetry workshop, our free Monday night fiction workshop. We got those up online right away. We expanded actually our paid uh, workshops um, somewhat, especially in 2020, somewhat less so in 2021. That was just a way of, um, you know, generating a little more revenue and when things were sort of really um, looking a little bleak um, financially. Um, and, um, you know, we've experimented with different formats. Um, I think in terms of um, what I particularly like doing online is actually um, making use of, you know, pre-recorded and edited videos. Um, we haven't done a huge amount of that, but we did a collaboration with the LA Times Festival of Books last fall, um, you know, uh, on their poetry stage where we took the, the videos the poets submitted and edited them. And I, I think that kind of control over, um, the format is uh, particularly exciting to me just in terms of it's, it's a little bit better than the average Zoom reading. I like the average Zoom reading as well, um, but that was very exciting. Um, and we used, uh, we used Crowdcast for that, which, you know, I'm, you, you're all probably familiar with that, but that's, um, I do think that's like a, in terms of a resource, that's a great online platform. Um, we are looking to reopen uh, in January. We're doing some renovations on the building right now. And so, uh, we haven't settled on a firm date, but I think we will probably be open roughly the last week of January to start resuming regular programming. We're gonna come back a little bit slowly. Um, we still have some work to do on the building and make sure everyone feels comfortable, but we're not fully there yet. Um, we have had a couple in-person events, but we haven't sort of resumed a regular schedule, welcoming people back to our bookstore, things like that. Um, in terms of what we're, our takeaways from the pandemic time, um, you know, I think there will be a combination of virtual and live events. We're very much a physical space. We have a theater, as I said, outdoor patio. That's very important for us to use and continually and continue to welcome people back to. But um, of course, the online events, I really like being able to reach people all across the country. I like to be able to put together programs internationally. Um, I hear an alarm going off, so I think my time is just about up. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to be open again and um, seeing some of you in our space and, and hoping to collaborate virtually as well. So thanks so much. Thanks, Quentin. Um, and like I said, if there's something that you really, really want to say and you're trying to wrap up, just it's OK. We it looks like we're going to have enough time for for everyone. So um, don't panic when you hear the, the little tone, but just know that maybe in a minute or so, <laughs> it'll be time. Um, okay, so up next, we have Katie Porter of the Inlandia Institute. Yay, hi, hi everybody. And it's so nice to see some familiar faces and names too. Um, so Inlandia is uh, located in Riverside. We serve all of inland Southern California which is about 29,000 square miles. Um, we have an uh, administrative office in Riverside. We have an outreach office in San Bernardino at the Garcia Center for the Arts. Um, but one thing I think that has worked in our favor during the pandemic is the fact that we don't have um, a huge facility to maintain. Um, our overhead is, is generally limited to staff and the money that we pay to presenters. So we were able to pivot fairly quickly. Um, you know, March, everything started to shut down, but by April, we were already starting to do some, um, we did a couple of pre-recorded events um, and we started doing live events and we learned about Zoom and of course have learned a lot uh, in the interim. Um, one thing that we've learned is that if you're going to host an event on Zoom, the webinar platform is the better option. Um, we've kind of mastered that, I think, in, in some ways. And, you know, granted, I'm always on this side of the screen. I'm not you know, from the audience side. But 
I'd say that there are a lot of major um, bonuses to doing these virtual events. And um, we maintained a schedule of several events per week. Um, all of our workshops uh, transitioned to online, including those with our seniors, uh, the senior centers. Um, people didn't have to fight traffic. They didn't have to, um, you know, drive in and find parking and, and climb stairs. You know, it's been, um, it's made it easier. We've actually had uh, better attendance for some things. And, you know, so during this period, um, we, as we got more comfortable with the tech, we did a lot of reaching out to our partners, um, in part because they do have venues like um, the Metropolitan Museum, now known as the Riverside, or Museum of Riverside, uh, the Riverside Art Museum, um, the Riverside Public Library, all of these places that um, people rely on for programming and services were closed. So we were able to partner with them and continue to provide programs, um, including, I think some of our best attended were for the, uh, around the Harada House landmark story um, about the Harada family in Riverside. And I think the, the best attended we had was around 143 um, unique viewers. Um, but another thing that doing things online has benefited us another way is we also have been live streaming to Facebook and then also archiving it on our YouTube page, which was a ghost town um, until after the pandemic. And now you can go to, you know, if you Google and Landia YouTube, you'll find, you know, several dozen events for all kinds of people um, from kids up to adults and seniors. We've um, launched a number of books during this period. Um, that proves challenging, doing a book launch online. Um, one thing that has definitely been difficult has been book sales this past year, because you don't have the hand sell um, aspect that you do if you go to an in-person event. Um, but that said, we've continued publishing books. We've continued to try and support our fellow members to give our writers um, somewhere to go and something to do. And um, we did a lot of free writing activities, things that we normally would have charged for in the past. We waived all the fees um, in recognition of the economic hardships of a lot of folks. Um, and I just feel like it, it really was not as bad on us as it was on others. And where we could um, help out, we did. Now we're in this kind of weird transition going back into in-person events. Um, starting in July, we had an, a really interesting typewriter exhibition, um, all kinds of typewriters from all different eras at the Riverside Art Museum. And that was our first foray back into in-person. We had a typewriter talk um, by somebody um, who's in the industry. And, you know, we thought things were turning up. And then of course, um, you know, things have taken a downward turn. We've kind of pulled back just a little bit from some of our in-person events. Uh, we had planned a book festival for October, which just didn't seem like a good idea. But um, sorry, yeah, it's okay. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, just a the bell went off. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't hear a bell. Yes, it went off. Sorry. <laughs> I'll okay. try to I'll try to let it linger then for the next folks, and then when I get the verbal cue, I'll 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 know that it was heard. Does that sound okay, ah. Jamie? Yeah, but I was transfixed by all of the. Um... <laughs> Uh, the great, oh, too. great so, stuff you were saying. <laughs> it, it's okay. I, I could talk all night, so I will just hang it up. But thank you. And I definitely didn't hear the bell, but I was listening. So, thank you, Katie. Thanks. Okay, so up next, we have Jen Dees with Pan America Los Angeles. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? 
Uh, yeah, great to see everyone. Um, familiar faces and new. I see Dorothy Randall Gray's name. Greetings to Dorothy Randall Gray. Sending love. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to share specifically. Uh, one is that um, it actually in partnership with Jamie, Poets and Writers, as well as Arts for LA, Penn LA is looking, looking forward to convening a potential coalition for advocacy purposes of literary presenters and nonprofits in the region. Uh, we have a small grant from California Arts Council for this purpose and are hoping to put together um, programming, maybe some petitions <laughs> uh, around, you know, areas of mutual interest. Um, all of this would come about through conversation and discussion. Um, our inspirations include uh, PEN America's own uh, Literary Action Coalition in New York, which includes literary organizations from each borough. We'd love to do something similar representing all the counties of Southern California. Um, so keeping that in mind, if you have um, other organizations that you think we should reach out to, we've had three very fabulous listening sessions so far uh, with lots of great ideas about how a coalition might practically uh, support uh, organizations uh, such as those that we represent. We are limiting this to nonprofit organizations or fiscally sponsored organizations that have you know, some sort of formalized structure. And uh, we are hoping to put together a website um, maybe early next year. So my email here is jds at Penn. Uh, please write me if you're interested. And um, another inspiration is the uh, a coalition that some who attend these, um, a network I should say, that some who attend these check-ins are a part of is the Arts for Healing and Justice Network. Um, they have a fabulous um, group of network members, um, all dedicated around a shared mission, mutually supportive um, with shared resources. Another other uh, ins recent inspiration is the Lava Coalition, a coalition of visual arts organizations that have formalized a coalition in recent months. Um, so just, just wanted to throw that out there, very preliminary. We also um, are looking for a new executive director, Michelle Frankie, the longtime executive director of Penn Center USA and now Penn America Los Angeles um, since 2018, has moved on to the Humanitas Prizes. And we are currently uh, working with a search firm to identify a new director. So if you have any ideas, send those two. Um, we're also hiring an assistant. Um, so we're at this point where it's like radical transitions happening every which way uh, for the organizations, uh, for our work, and we want to do it together, um, be part of the community here. Um, the job description, I'll, put, I'll drop that in. And I think that's about all that was on my agenda to share tonight. So I'll, I'll pass the baton, but greetings to everyone. Great to see each of you. Thank you, Jen. The coalition is going to be going to be amazing. So if any of your groups are interested, definitely uh, reach out to Jen. Um, okay, up next, we have Kristen Fogel of San Diego Writers, Inc. Hello. Thanks for having me, Jamie. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm Kristen. I'm from San Diego Writers, Inc. I've been the executive director there for going on 10 years now. I can't believe that. Um, so in normal times, what our organization looks like is we try to be this literary hub in San Diego. So we're offering anywhere from 10 to 30 classes per month, low cost, um, reading critiques. We offer readings. We do an anthology annually. Um, lots of collaborations between lots of good folks in the community. So we were really lucky last year in March 2020 that we just very quickly put all of this stuff on Zoom and we were relatively successful. Um, we have kind of an older population um, who is perhaps not as technologically savvy. So after we got over that, um, we were good to go. I'd say that everything was popular for a while. And if I'm being completely honest, that has dwindled since things have reopened uh, in June, June 15th. Uh, so we're still offering uh, all of this stuff online, but we've kind of seen a decline. And actually tonight I'm stuck at my home because we're offering our first in-person class. And so what that looks like for us is we are taking vaccination cards um, or a negative COVID test 72 hours before the start of class and people are masked. So we have one space in the Point Loma area of San Diego 
Um, we went down from three spaces uh, because of the pandemic. So we're trying that out tonight. And then we're also having an in-person slash Zoom hybrid fall for writing conference next week. So there are five days of programming, which I'll put in the chat. And so we're experimenting what that looks like too with uh, vaccination cards and, and things like that. So um, hopefully that's successful. We'll see how it goes. Um, takeaways from the pandemic. Um, I was I was blown away at how successful it was to just turn everything into online programming uh, and really, really proud of, of all of the instructors. We've got about 75 instructors that we work with, so they all just clamored to the challenge. Um, and what will look like is a mix of in-person and Zoom-oriented uh, programming from here on out. So um, I'm positive about where we're going. Uh, we're redeveloping our website so that's clean and fresh and uh, can be better acclimated with Zoom features. Um, and that's what we have going on. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for representing San Diego. And um, yeah, San Diego Writers Inc, they they have an amazing space and they have such a wide variety of, of classes. It's a great resource. Um, okay, I'm gonna call up next. If uh, your computer is gonna hang in there, Andrea Lopez of Tia Chucha Centro Cultural, forgive my terrible accent. Hello. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Um, I just switched to my phone because I didn't want any cutting off happening. But thanks for having me. Thanks for having Tia Chuchas. Um, my name is Andrea. I'm a program coordinator at Tia Chuchas Centro Cultural. We're located in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Um, how's my audio doing? Because I was resting my phone. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, we are a bookstore. We are also a nonprofit. Um, we do a lot of programming year round, one time events, and then um, also a series workshops going on. Um, we have a guitar class going on now, and that's a phone ringing because I'm in the office, but turn it off. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, the way we've dealt with uh, the pandemic um, and virtual events, it um, surprisingly was very good for us, a good learning experience for us. Um, we've definitely grown with our reach by doing uh, virtual programs. Um, at the beginning, we were wondering how to take everything we do into um, the virtual world, but like everyone, we hopped on Zoom, we made it work. Um, we've done things with our co-founder, Luis J. Rodriguez, um, who is an author and poet. Also, um, like I said, the co-founder of Tia Chuchas. Um, we live streamed these events um, on YouTube, made them available on Facebook as well. So we've had things like talks with authors such as Sandra Cisneros, um, also John Densmore, uh, the drummer of The Doors. We also have a Celebrating Words Festival, which is an arts and literacy festival every year, which it was a big event in person. Um, but since the pandemic, we've had to cut back a little bit Everything has gone online. So we've done like online art workshops, but um, I think the coolest thing we did is we started doing a book giveaway three years ago, a year before the pandemic. And we wanted to keep the book giveaway going. So we did a book giveaway drive-through. So we laid out the books um, and made it festive with balloons and other like art exhibits. And then people would take their cars with masks and everything and um, they'd pick up their free books. So that's uh, an exciting thing that we've done that I've loved so far. Um, another big one is we have a social justice book club that was meeting um, once a month at our bookstore physically. But once we went into pandemic mode, we went on Zoom and we were meeting people from all over the United States. So that was really cool. I think moving forward, we might wanna keep some version of both. We're still keeping it virtual, even though some of our programming is now in person. Um, yeah, and we're also gonna start another program called uh, Little Readers, which is something we started during the pandemic um, as uh, reading along to toddlers and families at home, virtually through Instagram. Um, but we're going to move that into an in-person thing where we're going to be like a traveling um, book reading club with 
parents and toddlers families uh i'm not sure if the bell has rang i just want to point that out it does oh no i'm wondering now if it is something to do with pitch i'm going to test yeah. it out thank you so oh. though thank you thank you for having me and i'm glad i stopped there <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea. And I'm glad that um, you were able to switch to your phone because it sounds like Tia Chucha has been keeping, keeping busy doing lots of cool stuff. So thank you. Okay, up next we have, uh, let's see, I skipped over. Okay, up next we've got Jerry Garcia with VCP SoCal Poets. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's nice to be with all of you today. Uh, so the VCP SoCal Poets is a, a nonprofit committed to the cultivation and advancement of poetry in Southern California that used to read in the San Fernando Valley. But um, since we were uh, refounded during the COVID pandemic, our goal is to provide the camaraderie and spirit of the original Valley Contemporary Poets, which was founded by Nan Hunt in 1980. In addition to cyber readings and eventually live readings, VCP SoCal has a goal to work with poets to produce new ways to promote themselves and their poetry. Um, so with the question of, you know, have I held events during the pandemic? The question is yes, uh, the answer is yes. I um, um, became in, uh, inspired to revive the uh, VCP in the, uh, the year 2019. Uh, and as we know, um, the COVID-19 curtailed most of my plans. I was going to have a reading later in 20. Uh, 20. So um, I saw other people working online and I decided to move to an all Zoom presentation. Uh, our first bunch of readings were book launch readings. We presented Beth Ruscio, um, Kim Young, Brian Sonia Wallace, Gail Ronsky. And um, after summer break, uh, summer and fall break, we are picking up uh, this Sunday. Um, so you can find information about us at vcpsocal.org. Uh, um, so um, I'm not resuming live readings. I'm going to, we're going to remain uh, an online venue with occasional readings, uh, live readings for occasional, uh, 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 for special occasions, I should say. So things like having, um, uh, book launches where we want to be able to sell the books uh, would be a, a purpose. Uh, I think our first live reading will happen in April when we're going to, since it's Poetry Month, and we'll try and make a, a festive venue out of that. Um, what I, I have found is that um, the idea of being able to present a poet from Ventura County with a poet from Whittier and another one from San Fernando Valley is uh, a, a wild thing. Uh, whereas before I used to have to have all those guys, those poets drive into our location. And uh, so I, I, did a, I did a survey a while back and what we found in the survey is everyone's pretty excited about doing the live events. I mean, the, um, let me rephrase that, about doing the online events because of that reach that they have. But um, we also miss hanging out together. So it's, you know, it's a tough thing. Um, we're probably going to work with some um, hybrid methods and, you know, it's kind of going to be all experimental just like it was uh, going online, going offline, and kind of getting back together with people, whether we wear masks and, and the like. Um, so that's really our presentation for now. If you want to look at uh, uh, what we've done so far, check out VCP uh, SoCal, SoCal Poets. No, I'm sorry, it's VC. I'll put it in the, in the thing, but our website will give you a lot of information. Thank you.
Thank you, Jerry. So yeah, that's interesting. One group sticking with the with the virtual events, um, probably because of the pandemic. Um, okay, up next we have Phil Taggart from Ventura County Poetry Project. Hello, <clears throat> yeah, I'm Phil Taggart, Ventura County Poetry Project. Um, we've had we were able to switch over pretty quickly. Uh, I teach high school, and so I had to switch over and learn it pretty quickly anyway. So we were able to switch over to our weekly reading uh, every week. We've been able to do a Zoom uh, as, and we also do readings in Thousand Oaks. And we tried Ojai and it, they're back to live, but because they couldn't figure out the Zoom. And we do, we help out with uh, Loose Lips in, in Topanga. We, uh, we, do their, we do their Zoom. So you know, we're kind of reaching out and helping people where we can. Uh, like every, like I heard is that it was really big at the beginning and now we're kind of slowing down a little bit because of the live events, but also I figure that a lot of people who are here, you can go anywhere now, and so they have. And so I think that uh, when we start, Nick, this Friday, this Thursday, we're trying our first hybrid. So I've been looking at how hybrids work. I've had to do it in my class. So I think I can probably do it at the library. A Thousand Oaks wants to do hybrid. And, uh, um, and I, oh, I wanted to thank uh, Poets and Writers for the Jackson Wheeler series. Uh, we had gone to the point where we were thinking we're just not gonna have it. And they came through and, and helped fund it. So we were able to keep it. And we're gonna try to put that on next year. We're not sure what that's gonna be because I don't think anyone knows how that's gonna look. But, so I'm gonna stick with hybrid as long as I can. One of the best things is, has been nice out hybrid. I get been able to feature someone from England, feature someone from Cambodia, feature someone from the Bay Area, and it has been wonderful. And a lot of these people are coming every week. And so I know, I realized at one point, well, I can go live, but I don't wanna lose that reach because um, we try to keep it as we would at a reading and how we run our readings. I open the Zoom at seven o'clock, Everyone gets there and talks, 7.30-ish, the reading starts. At, after the reading, we have a break, so people can talk some more, but mostly talk to the featured poet, then we have our open mic. And I, because one of the things I realize is that the community, this is where the community reaches. This is where the community meets. And uh, um, so I try to do that. And it's working pretty well. We get a lot of people that come on at seven o'clock just to visit. And so that's working pretty well. We've done, I've started a video workshop, which has kind of been off again, on again, uh, but we've been able to do that. We did, we, when we, for Black Lives Matter, we did Dear America, Black Lives Matter, a, uh, and, and edited it together and put together a kind of a, a, a piece about that. Now we're working on another piece called uh, Dear America, Tell the World We Lived, which is uh, talking to older poets and things that things that happened and what changed your life because so much changes but the changes are pretty universal and it's going to be taught in la la count or la city uh schools a couple of those schools and up here we're kind of building a curriculum uh we did our we did a couple of big uh, readings like the uh we had the vc poetry uh workshop a vc poetry contest and it was packed it was like we we actually had it was too big to put on Zoom, really. People were having to wait. And then we had the erotic reading this year on Zoom. And we were wondering how that was gonna work, but I think it might've been our best erotic reading as far as work. So we're, we're trying to figure it out like everybody. I mean, I kind of realized when we get back live again, uh, we're starting over again. You know, it's a new reading in sense. And I kind of know that. And everyone was kind of freaking out about it in the in the Ventura County Poetry Project people. And I said, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've done tons of new startups. It'll build, it'll be build, it'll be different. And I'm kind of looking forward to it. And I'd like, want to see people again. So, and I'm going to give you our website right now. And uh, you can look at, and we're horrible with websites because, well, I'm old and that's old technology. I'm an analog person in a digital world. 
they do my best. And I think I said enough, thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. Wow, teaching high school and doing readings every week. That's, wow, props to you. Um, <laughs> so, okay, I think last but not least of our special guests is Sochi Hulusa Bermejo with Women Who Submit. Are you here, Sochi? I thought I saw her pop into the participants. I, I Maybe saw we lost as her. Well. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out. Okay, okay. And then um, I think I think that's it for now, um, unless we have Hiram Sims. Is Hiram here? I did okay. not see Hiram. Yeah, I didn't see Hiram either. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next attendee. Uh, let me just scan this really quick. Kevin Bellows, would you like to do a check-in? Kevin, calling once. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just an individual. Um, I'm not associated with any poetry group except the poetry group that Dorothy Barisi teaches um, at, uh, in Los Angeles once a month. <clears throat> it, was a, it was originally started by David St. John, um, and then he, he got so busy at USC that he had to give it up. And I love doing it, but now I'm in San Francisco. Uh, and so the virtual thing has been a, a great blessing to me, uh, both in terms of my working with my fellow poets, but I would really like to know more about what's going on in Northern California. And so I thought I would join in on this and maybe Jamie, you could point me in the right direction. Yes, I'll be happy to reach out to you after, after today's event. Thanks. We do stuff for uh, Northern California as well. So I'll get you on that list. Good, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Okay, up next we've got Kakwasi Samadhi. Is Kakwasi with us? I think she was here earlier. Okay, we're gonna move, we're gonna move quickly through this. Cody Cisco. Hi, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Hi. Can, you can hear me okay? Yeah, um, well, it's been a pandemic. Um, I'm here with my Bookswell hat on. Um, Bookswell was started in 2017. It's a literary events and media micro enterprise. Um, and we held our first in-person event as part of Lambda Lit Fest in, at the end of 2019, um, amplify, amplifying queer voices of color um, at the Armory in Pasadena, and it was wonderful. And we thought, oh, we're gonna do a lot of these in-person events <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. Um, but we did go online kind of alongside everyone else in April of 2020. And um, from that month forward, we did maybe one per month. Um, some of those were fundraisers. Um, so our, our Juneteenth event in 2020 raised about $3,000 for Black Lives Matter LA. Um, and we've done a couple events for um, AIDS Walk LA and um, for Stop AAPI Hate. Um, so we do, we do a combination um, Zoom webinar, uh, YouTube live stream. Um, we use Eventbrite for our ticketing. Um, and I think that's all of the, the details that might be of interest. Um, and uh, I should say we are thankful for Poets and Writers for having helped us pay our um, participating authors to um, read their work um, on several occasions. So that was, that was great. Um, in 2022, we've planned about eight virtual events um, and we're able to do this um, because we did get a COVID relief fund grant um, and we're also crossing our fingers and hoping that a local arts department will um, respond positively to our proposal and, um, and sort of fund that season. Um, we're also looking for 
um, sponsors and collaborators because that if we if that proposal is accepted we'll have a good chunk of money to spend on promotion and i know that that is always more effective when you can pool um pool efforts um and so for us when we think about our events we, we really think of them more as like a blended online offline campaign um and, and an opportunity to build community i'm i'm looking into potentially starting a discord server for um writers and readers in los angeles um so we'll see but i think i've hit my mark i didn't hear a tone <laughs> but um yeah so we've got a lot planned potentially always looking for partners and collaborators and that's it thanks cody and you'll put all your links and everything in the chat so that collaborators can reach out <laughs> <laughs> sounds great. That congratulations on that grant and the the virtual events coming up. That sounds really exciting. Um, okay, up next we've got Charlie Jensen. Hello. Um, thanks so much for being here. It's great to hear how everyone's doing and the ideas that you've had. Um, so uh, the UCLA Extension Writers Program is turning fifty five years old this year. We've been around for a long time. We are one of the largest creative writing programs in the United States. Um, and we grew by 50% during the pandemic. So um, I, I've been to a lot of conversations where I've heard from peers in the field who have been really struggling. And uh, it's been difficult for me because our experience has been the opposite. Um, we had 9,000 enrollments in our classes over the last academic year, which blows my mind. I don't understand how that's even possible. Um, but we've drawn students from all over the country and all over the, all over the world into our program this past year. I think people have been seeking opportunities to connect and all of our workshops went virtual, both um, asynchronous uh, and also live over Zoom. We also moved a four day intensive workshop program that used to happen like eight hours in a classroom. We moved that to a virtual environment and worked really hard with our instructors to figure out ways to avoid Zoom fatigue and boredom for those students. And uh, I think that went really well. So we're doing it virtually again this year. We moved a one day conference from a live event with concurrent sessions to a virtual event with pre recorded lectures and live panels that people could tune into those live panels were recorded for later viewing so the one day event now elapses over a month and we loved it so we're going to forever do that from now on because it's so much easier to do th those virtual events than the stress and anxiety of being in the in-person event um we also created some free zoom based one day workshops for people who could just for for access and and community service and um, to get people writing during these times. They've been very successful. They tend to be larger, like 50 person classes um, and lect lecture based mainly. Uh, we've had a few events. Our events are all free um, and we've had really good attendance numbers. I'd say for, for readings, we've had over 100 uh, attendees in them and they're coming from all over the country, which is really exciting. We can't do that uh, on the ground. The downside for us is that we are totally limited in our technology by what the university allows us to use. So for instance, we can't use the Zoom webinar platform. Um, we have to make use of regular Zoom. And so we have basically duct taped and chewing gummed that version of Zoom as in all the ways we can to make it work like a webinar platform. Uh, and we learned it all by doing it wrong. Uh, we had a good time using this platform called Gather, which creates a virtual space that people can move around in and talk to each other. And that was amazing. And then the university was like, no, you can't use that. So that has gone out the window too. But Gather is great if you're looking for a solution like that, that can simulate an in-person environment. We're scheduling a few workshops in person for winter, uh, probably 10, but we're not eager to get back in person because our program is so successful virtually that we we want to continue to serve those students as much as we can. Um, UCLA requires all campus visitors to be vaccinated, to be masked, and to complete daily symptom monitoring. So I think right there are three hurdles that might make it more challenging for people to get to campus on top of the commute and parking and navigating Westwood. So um, it seems like the virtual environment has cleared a lot of the hurdles that existed for people in LA to get more involved with us. 
Zoom events are easier, cheaper, and a lot more fun to host, even with all of the technology woes that can come with them. So I think we want to keep doing them. And I think it makes us feel like we can reach a larger audience. Um, that time becomes more, uh, more effective for us and for our staff who are investing in those events. Uh, we have a larger impact. So I think that's going to remain a focus. We'll do a mixture of on-site events and virtual events as we move forward. So for resources, we are really struggling with staff capacity because while the writers program has really grown exponentially, the, we're one of two programs at Extension that has grown. The rest have like drastically declined in enrollment. So we're kind of the buoy uh, and there's just not a lot that the institution can do to support us. That said, I would be thrilled to work with anyone who wants to partner on any kind of event or program. So, um, you know, if it is uh, hosting a reading together or, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm really open. W would love to talk about ideas. We're thinking a lot about how we can create more accessibility considerations in our virtual events. So we're adapting to live captioning and transcripts and things like that. Would love any insider feedback that people can share about uh, ways to make sure that people with disabilities can participate fully in what we're offering. Uh, and that is all for me. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Charlie. That was a really great, uh, great check in full of full of info and very inspiring um, to hear how how much success you've had with the virtual um, switch. Okay, so up next, we have Tracy from Oh, sorry, Tuesday Night Project. Tracy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hey, Jamie, how's it going? Good. <laughs> um, I just have to say to Charlie, since he just spoke, I took the intensive in screenwriting at the beginning of this year, and it was awesome. So um, I thought you did an amazing job with, with making that what it was. Um, so um, I'm with Tuesday Night Project. Uh, we also have our programs manager here, Maya Worrell, on the call. Uh, we are an Asian American run produced uh, space in Little Tokyo. Um, this is, uh, we started in February of 1999 presenting Tuesday Night Cafe on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. It's a free public arts program. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, so we uh, present writers and poets, but also all kinds of uh, other um, uh, genres, uh, mediums, forms, and uh, practices. And uh, we also do other programs. So we were doing a live program called Tea and Letter Writing. So we would you know, gather up at the Japanese American National Museum around tea, and then we would write, uh, read some letters from the collections department from the museum and uh, write letters uh, related to um, themes of family separation and community separation. Um, and then we would partner with different groups to write letters to specific populations folks coming out of detention centers, folks in detention centers, um, folks who are currently incarcerated. Um, so we would work with different groups to do that. So we were doing that live for a while and then March 12th, uh, like the day after everything got canceled. <laughs> and we were supposed to have a, a program that night. I don't know if you remember, it like stormed that day. And as the minutes were going, we're like, I don't think anyone's gonna come tonight. And then one of our teammates was like, I'm kind of having to tickle my throat, I shouldn't go. Maya and I were like, okay, well, we could have everyone like 10 feet apart, you know? And, you know, storming, storming, storming. We're like, okay, we need to go virtual tonight. So within hours we shifted and we have been doing it um, ever since then. So we were doing it every other month and now we're doing, I think we're doing it every month and now we're doing it like every, other month. Um, so what was great about that, as other people have mentioned for their programs, you know, we've gotten to have so many folks join us from uh, the various time zones. Um, you know, people who would never be able to make it to Little Tokyo. So that was really, that's been really awesome. So we're continuing to do that. We decided to launch um, a workshop series featuring our own staff um, and their different uh, areas of expertise. So Maya is a zine master and um, has an awesome zine workshop. So we featured that. All of these programs are free to the community. Um, and uh, we decided not to try to duplicate Tuesday Night Cafe, the actual like our major big flagship program. Um, we decided not to try to duplicate that um, experience. We waited all the way till actually last week. We had our first virtual 
TNC where we had a very truncated show. It was only an hour. Um, you know, we really asked people to consider how they were interacting with both a camera that was a, a free moving camera with one of our filmmakers on staff and then also with the Zoom that was happening. So we've always live streamed. We've live streamed, um, we're in our 23rd year now and we've been live streaming a TNC for, oh gosh, at least a dozen years. But it would be, you know, maybe 15 at most, maybe 30 to 40 people tuning in online. But clearly um, last week, you know, people were just craving uh, the space. So we were at capacity with everybody um, coming online. So that was really cool. And I think we're definitely thinking of ways to shift um, to hybrid uh, models. So with the T and letter writing, we've been doing it more, we've been doing it longer virtually than we had in person. So now we definitely have folks at every call that are out, out of our time zone. So we wanna think about how we can have a table with the T and then maybe a computer at the end of it so that they can be sort of at the head of the table on Zoom with us as we're drinking the tea and writing, reading and writing letters. So we're, you know, just thinking all things and, you know, we're happy to share if, you know, if any of you ever wanna chat and, and share some advice with us and, and we're willing to share some of our thoughts as well on sort of how we got through the virtual TNC. So we, you know, cause we had live performance in our courtyard and we just closed it off. We had very strict COVID protocols. Um, we had individual bentos for everybody. You know, we, it was, it took a lot of work, <laughs> but it was really lovely. And it was nice to have our staff together in the space and some artists too. So um, that's where we're kind of at and uh, you know, hope to talk more. Hi, Dorothy. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all that information about all the wonderful work that you've been doing and the longevity of Tuesday Night Project is just amazing. Awesome. Um, okay, up next we have Hilda Weiss. Hilda Weiss, sorry. Hi, thank you, Jamie. I'm sorry I came in late, but it's good to be here. Um, we do Poetry LA, which is a website that features videos of poets in Los Angeles and the surrounding area of Ventura, down to San Diego, out to Riverside, et cetera. Um, we couldn't videotape live events during the pandemic because there weren't any, um, but we have three interview series and we were able to continue them via Zoom. Uh, that was a bit of a challenge, but we always had uh, a talk with the guests prior to the actual interview so that we could check the lighting and make sure that it was going to meet our preferences. Um, and for our Poetry Noir series, which is They Write By Night, we created the visuals and we used voiceovers from Suzanne Lummis, who's the host. So that was kind of creative and it made a lot of work for the visuals, but it was fun to do. Um, and now uh, this summer, we started back in doing in-studio video interviews uh, as of July of 21. And we make sure that everyone is vaccinated, um, but obviously doing an interview, they don't use masks. Um, and we started a new poet conversation program. So we had time during the pandemic to think up new ideas, which was fun. Um, as for the pandemic going forward, we're looking forward to doing uh, more on location videotaping. Um, and we, we hope that's gonna happen soon with as uh, the different venues start going forward. And we'll continue doing our video interviews, conversations and other dedicated series in studio because that's most convenient for us and gives us the best quality. And uh, we'll probably avoid doing Zoom as much as we can because we do want the better quality, especially the sound and the lighting. Um, and just on a personal note, um, Zoom allowed me to keep up with 
the different kinds of poetry things that were going on, you know, workshops and readings, um, and uh, working on my own lighting, being which I didn't bother to do much of today because I was coming in late. But we did discover uh, a makeup powder called Makeup Forever that has been really helpful in studio uh, improving people's touch up appearance the last minute. So thank you, Jamie, for letting me speak up. It's good to be here. Thank you so much, Hilda. It's great, great to see you. And thanks for all of the wonderful work that you've been doing. Okay, up next we have Anne Lee Ellingson. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Emily Ellingson. I'm co-editor-in-chief of Exposition Review. My co-EIC, Melinda Hensley, is also here today. She's waving in the Zoom square. Um, we're an independent, multi-genre online literary journal that publishes new, emerging, and established writers in fiction, flash fiction, nonfiction, poetry, stage and screen, film, experimental narratives, visual art, and comics, and everything in between. Um, we are currently accepting submissions for our seventh annual issue with the theme of flux. So if you're a writer, please send us your stuff. So we did a lot of the same things during the pandemic that we've heard so far this evening. Um, we also, although it's uh, nothing like the Tuesday night project, uh, we also on March 15th, 2020, had to pivot online uh, for a publishing workshop that we put on for emerging writers. Um, and that's something where we met in person um, and, you know, within a few days, put it on Zoom. Um, that first, uh, you know, we launched an issue in that May and, of course, couldn't do that in person. Uh, so we launched a podcast uh, featuring our writers reading and discussing their work and that we've had a couple of seasons of that. Um, and then this past year, we launched our issue um, with a reading on Crowdcast that was hosted by Skylight Books. Um, but what I thought I'd talk about today um, a little more in depth is our reading meetings. Um, in the before times, we would meet in person at a cafe in Los Angeles. And since these take place on a weekday evenings and given LA traffic, you know, inevitably it'd just be a few of us gathering while the rest of our team read remotely. Um, so last year we started meeting on Zoom instead. And during the first hour, readers and editors alike are invited to quietly read with their microphones and cameras turned off. Um, we post instructions on the screen, play a little atmospheric background music, share highlights in the chat. And then in the second hour, one of our section editors leads a discussion on their genre and how they use that time is really up to them. Our poetry editor, C.D. Eskelson, taught a masterclass on how to read a poem, for example. Our art editor, Brianna Smike, shared potential cover art with us in a meeting and we could listen to Brie talk about art all day. Um, our nonfiction editor, Ramona Pilar, led a, a little mini work generative writing workshop. So we did some writing in our reading meeting. And our experimental editor, Rebecca Luxton, explored the history of experimental narratives, including a live action reenactment of a Garfield comic. Um, so we had fun. Uh, gathering like this has enabled us to get to know our readers who now span the globe from Los Angeles and New York to Canada and Singapore. That's a theme I've heard all evening. Um, it also gives our readers a, a chance to get to know editors whose sections they're reading for. And it's a format I expect we'll maintain even after the pandemic subsides. Thanks so much for having us. It's really delightful to meet everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. It was fascinating to get a little inside scoop on, on the reading meetings. <laughs> for a literary journal. Okay, so up next we have Sarita Martin. Sarita. Hi everyone, I'm going to stay uh, without my camera because I'm in a very dark environment right now. You couldn't see me anyway, <clears throat> but I'm glad to hear all these exciting programs that are going on. And I posted something in the chat already, which you may have read, I'm involved in a number of programs and we have managed to keep going through um, Zoom and some of them have become hybrid at this point. <clears throat> so you may have seen Kristen's post about San Diego Writers Inc, where we have a fall for writing coming up. 
And um, Kristen, I don't know if Kristen has talked yet. Have you talked, Kristen? I have, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So you've already heard about that. So I won't take your time with re reiterating it, but it's November 11th through 15th, and I'll be teaching a workshop there. <clears throat> also, I'm the, the editor, the managing editor of San Diego Poetry Annual. And um, we have been having virtual readings um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and I'm involved with two children's programs, Kids SDPA and Border Voices Poetry in the Schools, uh, which have, have been um, trying their best to keep kids engaged. And they have um, workshops coming up and readings. Um, so um, nothing has really come to a standstill. It's just that we have regrouped ourselves to find different ways to do things. And I think that there's a new energy that has come about in the delight that people can finally start um, doing more of these things and getting together with each other. So the hybrid is a, is a fun thing to, to have happening now. Um, I don't think of anything else that I need to share with you Oh, I'm also teaching at Oasis, which is adult classes. Um, and that's for seniors that are over 50. <clears throat> and they have classes in all sorts of things. So that's been fun to teach there. That's a new development for me. So I guess that's what's going on. And thank you everyone for sharing what you have. Thank you so much, Sarita. Good to hear your voice. Up next, we have Dorothy Randall Gray. Hi, Dorothy. Dorothy, you're muted. Okay. All right, since so nobody reads lips here, not that I know of. Uh, um, so I'm representing Women Writers and Artists Matrix and Heartland Institute. We're a little different. And what we've been doing is giving workshops that utilize art and writing. So we have been um, having various workshops you know, just uh, in um, editing, memoir, craft, Afro, futurism, storytelling, um, bookmaking, felting, clay, uh, collage, uh, persona, uh, writing, um, glass craft, all these things. And so the people who come to our event are able, these are women, women writers, um, people who come to our events are able to try out either um, craft or, or the um, writing. And one woman writer came and she tried the glass workshop and made a piece and ended up getting first prize in a contest. So we just encourage uh, experimentation. They don't have to sign up ahead of time and decide which workshop they want to take. Um, they can just take whatever they want. We, there's also another um, component that we like to have there, which is creating community. So part of the importance of creating community is having people continue to connect during the year, uh, finding ways for people to um, continue uh, um, sharing their crafts and their, their notes and their writing um, and their writing. So one of the things that I started doing was um, talk about collaboration. I started like writing down all the places, some of the places that we've collaborated with. Um, it was a project with uh, Writers Without Borders and uh, that's connected with the uh, Boston uh, Public Library. Um, also in the meantime, men are working with them, which is a group of gay black men and doing workshops with them um, the Earth Lodge um, Center for Transformation, which is in Long Beach. And um, of course, the International Women's Writing Guild that I've been a member of for about um, 38 years or so. And then most recently, the Transformational Language Art Network, which is a, an, an incredible organization that utilizes writing and um, music, uh, social justice, um, all kinds of uh, ideas like that. So we do a lot. And, and with the pandemic, 
we had to stop doing in person. Um, what I ended up doing was doing a writing in art a workshop on Zoom and mailing the art supplies to the participants. I made up packages and I sent them all and then we did it all online. Um, we've done bookmaking online. So I have found that the Zoom has opened the doors to a lot of places, a lot of people. And so I get people from, we had, whole, we had a whole series of people from Africa, from Kenya and Ghana specifically. And then we got people from all over the world through Zoom. That's been one of the best things. People are, have been able to just come from Australia and uh, just every place. So it's broadened our reach. It's broadened the things that we do and the things that we're planning to do. So we are not doing in-person uh, events anymore. <clears throat> and we didn't do them this year. But next year, we plan to uh, resume, hopefully, our retreat and, and um, at a college that we utilize and an in-person event. If Delta, COVID, move, all of those things allow us to, to operate. What um, we are looking to do, and as an artist, I'm speaking as an artist and writer, uh, and as an independent contractor, you know, I'm looking to do um, more writing workshops as well as collaborations. Um, COVID stopped a whole lot of things, working with the students uh, who were incarcerated. Um, I did some online work with them and it's not Zoom, it's Microsoft something or other where you only see these black circles on a screen and you hear the voices, but you can't see their faces because they're adolescents, so they're not allowed to show their faces. It made it so impersonal. Um, so that has been very difficult. Some schools are doing hybrid, some schools are in-person. Um, so, and some of the work stopped for uh, an appreciable amount of time. Um, uh, last thing, um, I did a storytelling, uh, uh, storytelling uh, collaboration with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, doing storytelling and uh, printmaking with a printmaking workshop that was taught there. So continuing, this idea of using the arts, how the art inspires writing and the writing inspires art. And that's, that's one of the main um, focuses or foci that we utilize. That's Thank you so much, Dorothy. Always a pleasure to see you and hear, hear about what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Up next, we have Barbara Mosberg. I think we lost Barbara, she was here earlier. Um, so we'll move on to Laurel Blossom. Laurel. Hi, Jamie, thank you. I'm just, um, I'm just a poet and I'm here just to learn and listen and say hi to the folks that I know and, um, and uh, make some new acquaintances. So thanks very much. Thanks for being here, Laurel. Laurel is a very early poets and writers person. <laughs> the very early uh, uh, childhood of poets and writers she was working for the organization. So, um, okay. I think the next person up is Wendy Van Camp. Hi, Wendy. Hello there. Hello. Let me get my little blurb up here, hopefully. Ah, there it is. Anyway, uh, hi, everybody. I'm the convention coordinator for the SFPA, which is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. We are an international group of poets that band together to do group readings at all the national science fiction conventions here in the United States and overseas. And Somehow they talked me into coordinating all that. <laughs> so I'm here basically to hopefully find some new places for our poets to read. 
Um, we like to do virtual events because it allows um, our poets who, for instance, have cancer or are in wheelchairs to fully participate in the programs. And so I always ask for virtual programs first. However, we do arrive in person as well. And uh, we do have a nice group of speculative poets here in the Los Angeles area. We usually have a panel at LostCon, um, which is the um, Los Angeles um, Science Fiction Literary Association's main event um, at the Marriott uh, near the airport. Um, but we do these, these sort of things everywhere. I just went to Denver to um, facilitate a reading of our group and we did three panels and we uh, were asked to do a poetry improv, which thank God I didn't have to do because that looked very, very intensive. But the, the poets that participated certainly had a good time. And I must admit, I laughed very hard in the back of the room <laughs> watching them. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to let everyone know that we are here. We have award-winning published poets who are looking to uh, come and do readings. We like to come together as a group of like four or five poets. I have, uh, I have about 40 or 50 people waiting for slots. So if you can accommodate a, a panel about speculative poetry, where we can come and read a little of our work and then talk about what speculative poetry actually is, because a lot of people don't really realize that speculative poetry is a thing. Yes, it is. It has a huge community worldwide and many publications that specialize in it. I actually am the editor of an anthology of speculative poetry called Eccentric Orbits. I'll be opening a call uh, at the top of the year for the next issue. Um, which we release in April for National Poetry Month. Um, so there's a lot going on with our organization. We're always looking for new members. Um, we're volunteer run. Uh, we have two magazines that we pay poets uh, who are accepted into. One is called Starline and the other is Eye to the Telescope. We ha have an award system in place. We give the Elgin Award for Best Speculative Book of the Year and Best Chat Book of the Year. We have an award called the Risling, which is for Best Speculative Poem of the Year, and one called the Dwarf Star, which is for the Best Sci-Fi Coup or Short Form Micro Poem of the Year. Uh, Sci-Fi Coup, for those that don't know, is science fiction themed haiku. Uh, which is my specialty, actually. So um, anyway, um, like I said, I'm just here. If you have um, some kind of um, uh, meeting or you're looking for some kind of new programming, I guarantee you um, people probably have not heard of speculative poetry and they would probably be delighted to hear us. Uh, please go ahead and contact me. My email is in the blurb I left and I also put up our website so that you can read more about us online. And thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Sounds really interesting. Um, okay, off we go to the next person on the list, which I believe is Linda Crawford. Oh, I, I am here in semi-darkness. I actually had put in the chat early on that I'm here to listen and to learn. I'm not part of a group. I've gotten into poetry and I'm just going into every workshop um, that's available to me. And I do want to say just two quick things. I absolutely am so supportive of Beyond Baroque because when I moved to LA and then was looking to say, let me now get back into the writing that I had left in my twenties, that's the first organization that I came across. And it's a very supportive organization with a lot of workshops. So I do have to say that. And then a nod to um, Sarita because I've seen her just in some of the various open mics that I've attended and it was great to hear uh, what she's working on because in those open mics, you really don't speak about what you're doing. So just uh, wanted to say that. Yeah, this is very informative. I've missed the in-person um, gatherings that you've had and I appreciate uh, the online so they can stay in touch. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda, for being here. I thought maybe that was the case, um, yeah, thank you. but I wanted to give you a chance. And I'm glad because uh, you had some good things to say. So thank you for joining us. Okay, up next, I'm so excited uh, to meet you, Nancy Tubbs, uh, online. 
Um, so you're up next. Hi, I'm Nancy. I run an event publicity service called Full Calendar. And I uh, read about this. I thought, well, this will be really interesting to hear what people are doing because um, I don't publicize events. I just sort of hear about them after the fact. So um, really just learning is fascinating. It's kind of what I thought was happening, but you know, it's the range of things that people are doing are great. The only uh, resource, the only thing I could say that might be helpful is pre-pandemic, none of the media wanted online events. They were sort of viewed as webinars that were trying to sell something. And now everybody wants online events. So, it, I mean, they're dying for them because they have nothing else to, to publicize in their calendars. And so go ahead and get them out there. Um, they tend to want them in their basic geographic area. So they're not going to want, you know, an LA publication is not going to want to put stuff in Boston unless there's some LA connection, like there's an LA writer speaking, something like that. So that's it. And thank you all. This has been really interesting. Thanks for joining us and for sharing events on the Literary Lit List. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, up next we have Hazel Clayton Harrison. Hi, Hazel. Unmute. Hi, everybody. Um, I really hadn't planned on saying very much, but um, it's really good to be here. I got in a little bit late. I was um, coming from uh, another event, but um, I've been doing a lot of writing through the pandemic, a lot of editing of other people's works. And I guess the, as, as far as an organization is concerned, I would say that I'm representing the International Black Writers and Artists Organization with chapters in Los Angeles and Pasadena. And what we do basically, the organization has been around for over 40 years now. Um, they don't really make a lot of noise, but they do a lot of work. I want to say in mentoring um, and um, supporting writers in the Black community, Hispanic community, uh, LGBTQ communities, and, and etc. cetera. Um, right now, we're working on producing a legacy event that will be held in February during Black History Month. And it will be to honor many of our members who have passed on. And you may recognize some of the names. As I said, it's um, IBWA doesn't have a loud microphone, but they've worked with a lot of uh, known writers in the community, such as Octavia Butler, was a longtime member of our group. Um, C, uh, I want to say C. Jerome Woods, but um, Eric Dickey, who passed away last year, um, and we miss him dearly. Oh, um, Kahinde Wiley, who is an artist, and he did the wonderful painting of Michelle and Barack Obama that has been displayed. Actually, I think it's on display at LACMA now. So a lot of writers have come through our organization. And I'm just so happy right now, the two workshops are being held, one in LA and one in Pasadena, and they're both on Zoom. And in 2022, we'll probably do, start doing more hybrid type programs. But we're still around. And I just wanna say hello to everybody and let you guys know that we're here. Um, and I will um, try to put something into the chat about our email address so that you can um, uh, get a hold of us. And we're also on Facebook. So thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and um, I didn't know about that organization. So it's really, really good to learn something new. Um, I think that was everyone. Now, if I missed anybody, now is the time to raise your hand. Yeah. Amy, um, I'm Irene. 
Hello, Karen. I am so sorry, Karen Greenbaum. That's all right. That's all right. I, I registered at the last minute because, um, well, I'm speaking on behalf of Fourth Sundays in Claremont, California, and our chair bopped in this morning to tell me that she discovered other commitments. So I registered at the last minute and I might not have made your list. Anyway, um, we're Fourth Sundays. That's when we meet, Fourth Sundays. People ask, so when do you meet? This gets tiresome. Um, we had to make our big change last year when the library, which is our umbrella organization and the one where we hold our meetings, um, closed, or at least closed to people coming in and out. So uh, we decided we also would go dark, but when we realized by August that things weren't going to open up anytime soon, we decided really we wanted to keep the readings. We missed it, our poets missed it, our community missed it. Um, so we set up Zoom and live streamed our monthly readings over our Facebook page. Now, a lot of you also had this experience, but we went from an attendance between 40 and 50, which is pretty good for a live poetry reading, to 900 views. Um, this was pretty fabulous. We also started realizing the, uh, the possibilities of Zoom and we're booking poets, booking teachers from all over the country and all over the Americas, in fact. Um, we just reopened to live readings in a rented space because the library is still not open to public events. Um, last month we had, sorry, September we had 15 people. Last month we had 20. That's not bad. Everyone's masked, everyone's distanced. Um, we'll see what happens in the spring when the weather is cooler, but likely we'll just keep the windows and the doors open unless things change again. We'll find out. Uh, and Jamie, I do plan to start to resume applying for grants. We're daring to have our annual open mic event this month that's always very well attended. Let me see. It I should mention that we are on the very easternmost edge of LA County. Um, we are about 50 miles east of downtown and about 80 miles, maybe 60 miles away from Katy and Riverside. I'm never quite sure how far it is, but I know it takes a really long time to get there. So people were happy not to be driving from LA. Our audience tends to skew gray for a lot of reasons. So all kinds of people who were outside the usual age range were tuning in. That was a lot of fun. We also noticed the uh, technology, the age-related technology divide, um, but we managed. Let me think, is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, well, the main thing really is that uh, it's easy to take for granted that there are things like live poetry readings and Zoom is better than nothing. It has some advantages, but there's no substitute for being face to face. Thank you, Ricardo, I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Karen. It's good to, to see you on Zoom. Okay, has everybody had a chance to represent? I didn't, I didn't call on folks who, whose organizations already spoke, just to respect everyone's time, but I, I think I got you all. Great, so 
we're not going to have time for a discussion and response. Um, I want to respect your time. And I'm going to use the last minute to give my little check in, <laughs> which is that uh, Poets and Writers Readings and Workshops mini grants program is making grants for both virtual and in person events. Um, I believe on our website, it says that we're only funding virtual events through the end of this calendar year, uh, but that is now extended through the end of our fiscal year. So we will be funding virtual events through June 30th, 2022, at least. Um, so that's really good news because I know we're not all quite ready yet to jump back into the room with each other. Um, <laughs> as much as um, I love you all. <laughs> um, so that is the main update for readings and workshops. We would love to receive uh, grant applications for writers. These grants are for uh, writers fees. Uh, for writers who give public readings or teach creative writing workshops in community settings. Um, we take applications from all kinds of individual organized groups, uh, reading series, you don't have to have nonprofit status to apply. Um, we get a lot of reading series that are run by an individual, they apply under the name of the series. Um, so it's, it's very, very easy to apply. Um, and we are especially interested in funding events that reach underserved or marginalized groups. Uh, we have a specific interest in funding creative writing workshops that are community-based, um, that are reaching you know, elders or intergenerational groups, um, you know, formerly incarcerated folks. Um, so if if you are someone who's doing that kind of work, um, I hope you'll consider taking advantage of the readings and workshops program, but we also just fund regular reading series as well. So um, that is fine too. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to me or to Ricardo, and we'll be happy to um, guide you through the very simple application process. Um, we're going to be sending a roster of all the folks who were here. Um, in a few days, probably. So you'll get that. And um, I also would love to get your feedback about, about the event. If you have a minute, um, I will send you a link to a feedback form um, when I send you the roster. And I just wanna send out a special thanks to our special guests who um, committed to being here and to all of you who also showed up. It was really wonderful to hear all of the amazing work that you are all doing. I feel so very, very inspired and just proud of writers and presenters um, in Southern California. Um, there's so much going on and I think we've really weathered the storms quite, quite well. So thank you so much and hope to see you at the next event. <laughs>